I am very delighted to have an opportunity to speak to this audience uh, this afternoon. When uh, a suggestion was made by Florence that uh, I should come and talk here, I had some mixed feelings. The last time I was here, I was attending a presidential debate. And um, I was not, don't think that I was very fairly treated. But uh, I said I would come again. And I've come again and again to this, this place. So I'm very happy to see this audience this, this, this afternoon. I was asked to talk about a vision for the next 60 years and beyond. 60 years ago, our people proclaimed our country's independence. With that, we affirmed that our natural right as a people to be masters of our own fate and destiny. But how did we end up as Kenya? It is important that you go back into history. Kenya, the name Kenya was coined much later by missionaries. Uh, um, there's too many versions to it, saying a missionary, I think it was called Mr. Rebman, was talking to a um, um, around Mount Kenya, and he said, uh, they were talking about Kinyaga. Kinyaga. And the Fusungu said, Kenya. I was talking about Kenya. But then this geographical space called Kenya was drawn in over 100 years ago in Berlin, at the Berlin Conference, where the imperial powers met. And at that time, there was scramble for Africa. So they decided to partition Africa. 1884-85. So Africa was then parceled out uh, to various colonial interests, imperial powers, Portuguese, Spaniards, the British, the French, the Italians, and the Belgians. Spain got a, a small portion of it. So this is, this is how these maps were drawn. And these maps were drawn artificially in Berlin without any regard to the people who were living in Africa. So Africa was artificially divided among the Colombian imperial powers. That's why you see that borders among many African countries are straight lines. If you see a border with Somalia, it is a straight line. Uh, one line inside and one straight line and another line outside. A border with then Tanganyika was a straight line from Lake Victoria all the way to the Indian Ocean. It was only in 1860-something because Tanganyika was given to the Germany, to the German territory. And uh, on the German emperor's birth, 50th birthday, it was called Otto von Bismarck, Queen Victoria, who was the head of the British Empire, in a gesture said that on your 50th anniversary, I give you the highest peak in Africa, Kilimanjaro. And that is how, you see, Kilimanjaro was originally in Kenya. But then you see the map between Kenya and Tanganyika, now Tanzania, a straight line from Lake Victoria to Kilimanjaro, then it comes into Kenya, takes Kilimanjaro to Tanganyika, then again a straight line to the Indian Ocean. That is how it was done, it's arbitrary. Then, uh, but 
formal colonization actually of Kenya took place in 1904. But when the British first came here, they started building a railway line. By building a railway line, and they built a railway line from Mombasa. It was called Kenya Uganda Railway. It was built from Mombasa up to Kisumu. You ask yourself, if it was Kenya Uganda Railway, how did it end up in Kisumu? The reason is at that time, Kisumu was part of Uganda. Uganda's boundary came all the way up to Naivasha. From Naivasha up to Lake, uh, up to Lake Turkana, the west of that was Uganda. That's why it was called Kenya Uganda Railway. When it reached Kisumu, it had reached Uganda. From there, they were now taken by ship across the lake to Port Bell in Uganda. Then, um, but then this Kenya was called actually just a territory. It was actually run by a company called British East Africa uh, Corporation. They were just using it for hunting, um, coming to look for, search for gold and ivory. But then came one colonial master, one imperialist by the name of, uh, uh, his, his other name, but later on he became known as Lord Delamere. He came through Somalia on a horseback. And when he came on a horseback, he arrived on Mount Kenya. And then he saw a very beautiful land around Mount Kenya. He came down through Laikipia into what is the present day Nyahururu, what they called Thompson Falls at that time, into the Rift Valley, through Nakuru, Njoro, Eldoret, or Tsugishu, up to Mount, Mount Elgon. So he found a very beautiful land. So when he came back to Nairobi, he went and met the governor. He told the governor that, look, you have a beautiful land here, which is ripe for large-scale agriculture. You have built a railway line from Mombasa all the way to the west. But the railway line will have nothing else to transport. It will be transporting goods from Mombasa to interior. But on the way back, it will be going back empty. To make this railway line productive, you need to introduce large-scale agriculture. So this is now Lord Elimir. And I'm ready to go back home and campaign and bring white settlers to come and settle here and uh, do large-scale agriculture on condition that you agree that each person I bring here will get 10,000 acres free plus black laborers. The governor agreed. And after that, now they signed an agreement with Lord Delamere. Lord Delamere was going to bring settlers here. Each settler who came would get 10,000 acres free, uh, plus black laborers. But then, um, Lord Delamere then went back to England. He addressed town hall meetings in London, in Birmingham, in Manchester, in Liverpool, telling them that down there you have found land which is flowing with milk and honey, the biblical Canaan. And whoever 
get me to come there, we'll get 10,000 acres free, plus free black laborers. At that time, the story about Africa was very, very uh, disturbing and worrying in England. Nobody wanted to come, but come here. Most people did not want to come. So you got very little response. In frustration, he said he came back to Kenya. When he came back, someone suggested to him to try down south. So he went down south. He went by ship from Mombasa to Durban. And in Durban, he addressed town hall meeting. Durban, Port Elizabeth, East London, uh, Cape Town, Kimberley, Joburg. There he found a white man who had lived in Africa for generations and who did not fear Africa. They agreed easily to come. The prospect of coming and having their own land, because a number of them were laborers and their own fellow white farms, was very appealing. So they came. And that's how the most of white settlers who were here during that period came, a majority Boers from South Africa and Rhodesia. So thus they came here, they got land and got laborers. Uh, and so that's how Kenya was then occupied. So we ended up with what was called the white highlands in this country. And people were moved, population were moved to create space for these people to settle. From Lakipia, from the, the slopes of Mount, 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 Mount Kenya, the Maasai communities were living there. The whole of that Lakipia plain were moved. Around Naivasha, there was a corridor, 10 mile corridor, opened for Maasai to pass with their chasing zombies to go down to Narok and uh, Kajiado, as they called. Some Maasai's were moved from Eldoret area. That area is called Wasingishu County today. But the Wasingishu Maasai are now in Transzoya, where they live. They were moved from there to create space for Wasungus to settle in those areas. In Kiricho and Bomet there, the large chunk of land was taken away from the Kipsigis and turned into tea estates. The same thing happened in Nandi. The same thing happened in Central Province area here and around Mount Kenya area. People were moved away from the lands and to create space for large scale farming. So that is how Kenya was now settled by the white men. And then the white men, um, of course, they, they set up administrative structures in the country and ran this country for 60 years. So Kenya is now 60 years independent. It was also 60 years under proper colonial rule. So today now you are almost at 50-50 now. To so look at what happened, what did the colonialists do in that 60 years, and what have we done ourselves in the 60 years? Over the years, the joy of so we attained independence after a long struggle, because Kenyans were being oppressed Seriously, the land had been taken away. Um, um, Africans were classified as, as not even second class, third class uh, uh, people. You had apartheid in this country. There was the white man, there was the Indian, there was the Arab, and then there was the African, number four, at that time. And 
people rose up uh, in resistance to this colonial rule. You will hear the story of Chief Koinangi, who in 1912 had to go to the court to apply to be allowed to plant coffee in his farm, because no natives were not allowed to plant coffee. And he had to fight to be allowed to, to, to plant coffee. People were not allowed to settle in certain parts of their country. So there was resistance in 1922. A man called Hari Duku led a demonstration in the center of Nairobi, near where the central police station is today. And the colonial police opened up fire, and many people were killed. Some were arrested and detained. Hari Duk was taken to Kismayu, which is then part of Kenya, and he was detained there for several years. Then came later on the struggle for land, the Mao struggle. But there was also struggle in other parts of the country. We were in Kenya. But before that, the Nandi resistance, which you heard about, led by Samuel Koitalel. The Kamba resistance here, led by Mwindu Mbingu. Uh, the resistance by the people of Western Kenya, Ojijo Teko, Agula Awala, Elijah Masinde, Wanameme, just to mention but a few. You will remember, of course, Mekatiri uh, Wamenza um, from the coasts. So there were several uh, people of this country who resisted colonialism. Eventually, uh, Mau Mau Freedom Movement came up in 1952. And a state of emergency was declared in this country. Many people were arrested, were detained. Very many people were killed during that struggle. It's a very bloody struggle. You must remember that before that, a man called Wayaki Wahinga was arrested from his home, taken all the way to the Savo, made to dig his own grave, and was buried alive in his own grave. So uh, the struggle was, was very bloody, but in the end, independence came. And the independence was a combination, the struggle was a combination of the freedom fighters who were fighting and those who mobilized the masses to protest, to urge for independence in this country. And of course, you remember the Kapengoria 6, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, Villar Kagia, Chengoneko, Kumu Karumba, Fred Kubai, Paul Ngei. Then came the first elected African members of Lejiko. You remember Jaramogo Gengo Dinga, Masinde Muliro, Tom Boyer, uh, um, Lawrence Oguda, Daniel Rapmoy, Ronald Ngala, Zao Mwimi, those were the people who were elected members. Eventually others joined and independence came on the 12th of December. Now when Kenya became independent, of course people were very, very expectant. Kenyans were some of the most optimistic people at that time. Uh, because you attained independence. 
people uh, thought that prosperity will come immediately with independence. Uh, but at that time, they coined what you would call the Kenyan dream. The Kenyan dream as coined by the founding fathers of our nation. And you find it in our national anthem that says, God bless this land of ours. Just be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. What does this mean? God, God bless this land of ours. Justice be our shield and defender. Justice can only be a shield and defender if there is democracy. May we dwell in, 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 in unity, peace, and liberty. P unity means that people who are united, people who, where there is no form of discrimination, other than the basis of race, tribe, religion, or gender. It's when you, and peace and, and, and unity. Peace. Peace is not merely in the absence of war. Peace is not merely in the absence of war. Somebody who is hungry is, cannot be peaceful. A hungry person is, cannot be peaceful. So uh, it has got a wider meaning, that peace that is talked about there. But finally says, plenty be found within our borders. Plenty be found within our borders is a very strong statement. That plenty was not going to drop like manna from heaven. It was going to be a product of the sweat and toil of the people of Kenya. Meaning what? Meaning that you must create a conducive environment for people to create wealth. People must be enabled to create wealth. And they say freedom and the rights. One is the, the right to life was fundamental. To the right to health is fundamental. Right to quality education is fundamental. Right to food is fundamental. Right to, um, to talk to education. Right to, uh, to education. So all these were there. But then people were expectant. But over the years, the joy of independence has been tempered by many battles, a struggle that has continued for six decades. We have fought poverty, we have fought ignorance, we have fought disease, we have fought corruption, and we have fought tribalism. But these challenges march on with us, in spite of our tribulations and against monumental odds. We have fought and we are still struggling to build a thriving democracy. We are still fighting for individual freedom within our free nation. We have become the beacon of hope for the millions of immigrants for the four corners of the earth. We are struggling to forge a free and modern society that lives by the ideals of liberty, justice, and respect for human rights. We have fought and we are still fighting not to let any obstacle stand in the way of our destiny. I have been extremely fortunate to see the emergence and pro progression of Kenya up and close. First, and the son of a freedom fighter, my father was involved. <laughs> Two, of the son of the first vice president uh, for a brief period. <laughs> the 
two years as son of a vice president turned a detainee, a, a fighter for the second liberation, a detainee myself, as a minister, an opposition leader, and as a prime minister. The people of Kenya endured the pain of colonialism, the tragedy of single party dictatorship, and the horror of the economic collapse of the 1980s and 1990s, enabled by the elite corruption and the weird uh, policies like the structural adjustment programs of the World Bank and IMF. In these periods of colonialism, elite corruption and ethnicization of national life, colors and coal leaders took away lives and broke up, uh, apart families through detention camps, jails, assassinations, and state-enabled high level of poverty. But all these tragedies and unfortunate turn of events could not take away the spirit of the Kenyan people. I have seen Kenyans pick the armor of courage to confront dictatorships and bad regimes. This 60th anniversary is therefore a good time to reflect on our past. It is also a time to look for the future. Where will this country be on the 120th anniversary of its birth another 60 years from today, which will be the year 2083? This is a challenge that I want Kenyans to reflect on where we are going to be 60 years from today. Will we still be a country going around the world with begging bowls? Will we still be a country struggling with the weight of corruption, tribalism, lack of accountability, and empty promises for which the promise makers pay no price? Are we able to set the stage for a future a dramatic departure from the Kenya of today. As a nation, we have always had great ideals on paper, including in our constitution and various policy documents like the Vision 2030. We have values and principles of, of governance that include patriotism, national unity, sharing and evolution of power, the rule of law, democracy, and participation of the people. We also aspire for human dignity, equity, social justice, inclusive inclusiveness, equality, good governance, integrity, transparency, and accountability, among others. We aspire to live in unity, peace, and liberty. We aspire to be a nation of plenty. We aspire to be a caring nation that provides the best possible medical care to all its citizens. A nation that provides the best possible education to its children for free. That's why we promised, as a Zimio, free education from primary secondary, up to university level. We've always aspired to be the nation that extends a helping hand to the elderly, the needy, the widows, and the orphans through social security safety net programs. The founding vision is a critical document for nations that proceed to succeed. Now that we are in the Catholic institution, we can turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 1, for an understanding of the value of the founding vision. God talks to Joshua about the founding vision in the following words, like quote. 
be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful." Unquote. Today, you are way off the original dream. The nation is reeling under the heavy burden of corruption, officially sanctioned, officially sanctioned tribalism, heavy burden of taxation, and a harsh and heartless leadership. We are not the confident nation we have been over the decades. Once upon a time, Kenyans were too proud and so confident of their nation that they refused to seek jobs abroad, including the United Nations. Today, our people are scrambling to leave the country. A recent study by Pew Research showed that up to 54% of Kenyans would wish to relocate from the country. Our children are struggling to get farm jobs in Israel, to be house help in Saudi Arabia, and security personnel in Qatar. And the president is looking for jobs for them there, to become ayahs there. <laughs> Government officers themselves including a whole president, openly say that they're trying to get jobs abroad for Kenyans. Young people with the new skills and knowledge that we need are being exported because the government cannot create jobs. And the government sees it as an achievement. It is the responsibility of our government to create jobs in the country, not to look for jobs outside. When you have a whole president going running out there and looking for jobs for people here, something is terribly wrong. We live on debt, but we still live large. We drove ourselves into the trap of the IMF and the World Bank and their unusual conditionalities that are driving us back to the 1980s and 90s. We are on the downward spiral and a steady one at that. We are staring at a gloom future. We are uncertain and fearful of what tomorrow holds. We live one day at a time because the longer term founding vision has been dropped. It is my position that if we return to the founding vision of this country, Kenya can emerge in its 80th or 120th anniversary as one of Africa's greatest democracies and a secure and flourishing homeland for her children. You can imagine the democratic state that is governed by law, respects human rights, and rejects corruption. I deliberately put emphasis on pursuit of democracy and rejection of corruption as a critical pathway to Kenya's progress. If we return to the founding vision in the coming decades, Kenya will be able to witness a period characterized by tolerance and integration between communities. The country will witness equitable sharing of the wealth that God put at our disposal. If we return to the founding vision, Kenya will live through a period where leaders answer to the people, not the other way around. We'll have a country where leaders focus their energies on important things like founding education and schools, funding education schools, fighting corruption, creating jobs here for the children, we educate and, and casing the bad, bad, 
burdens of the people. Kenya will then open up a hopeful chapter in which her people can live a normal, normal lives. As things turn today, Kenyans are not living normal lives. The dramatic departure the country needs for, for, from the sorry state of affairs of today will not arrive easily. Many will say it cannot happen. It will meet violent and even deadly resistance. Transition is a bold vision, but I know it can't be achieved. I have been fortunate to live long enough to witness nations and regions turn around their fortunes in 50 years or even less. Think about the current prosperous and stable Western Europe. Europe went through total war and genocide that ended in 1945. During and after that war, it was difficult to believe that 50 years later, Western Europe would be free, peaceful, and prosperous. And I happened to have been in Germany, which was the aggressor, and which was completely devastated. Most German cities were raised to the ground by bombs after the war had actually ended. But 15 years later, when we went to Germany and then went to Britain or France, we think that it was Britain and France that lost the war and that Germany won the war. It happened because of foresight, dedication, and hard work of the people. South Korea went through a crippling war and sought help from Ethiopia during the war between 1950 and 1955. Ethiopia sent 6,037 soldiers to Korea. Now Korea provides aid to Ethiopia and to Kenya and all African countries. Kenya once, once, once upon a time gave aid to Singapore before Singapore Zoom passed us. In a mere six decades, Japan emerged as a democracy and an economic powerhouse manufacturing and exporting high quality products to every household in every part of the world. When I was growing up as a child, people did not want to see anything in Japan. Japan quality was known as inferior quality. Nobody touched anything Japanese. Today, Japan is equal to high quality. People want to don't question Toyota anymore, uh, and so on and so forth. Within vision, a lot can happen in the next 50 years, and I pray that Kenya can rise to the occasion. At this moment, it is proper to recognize and say thank you to the nations and the development partners that have stood with us in our journey as a nation over the last 60 years. And here, we talk about the US, the UK, the EU, China, Japan, Korea, among others, we thank you. We have our neighbors to thank for this 60 years journey as a nation. Uganda remains our biggest and most reliable trading partner. We thank them for the loyalty. Tanzania, remains a second home to Kenyans because of their friendliness and people-to-people -people ties across the border. We thank them. We thank the entire East African community block of, of nations for their support and friendship. It is my firm belief that if we made good use of the help and good goodwill that the nations like the US, UK, EU, 
China and others are extending to us, Kenya can emerge from the poverty and take its place among the economic powers. If we cemented and respected the ties we have with our neighbors, Kenya can cement its place as an economic powerhouse and grant, grant of democracy in the region. But something stands between us and the future, which is desire. Corruption is killing our future. Tribal, tribalism is stealing our potential. Under the current regime, these two vices are officially sanctioned. The country is divided between people with the shares and those with no shares. Shame on them. The corrupt are getting plump jobs and state protection, while those who try to stop corruption get arrested and arraigned on trumped up charges. In the case of KCP, indications are that NEC as an institution will be sacrificed to protect the cartels. I therefore wish to call on our development partners to partner with us in calling out the ills of corruption and tribalism and crippling, uh, that are crippling our country and making nonsense of the aid we obtain from abroad. The transformation of this country deserves requires a generation of leaders with the courage to confront and defeat corruption and tribalism and direct public resources to public causes without discrimination. We need a generation of leaders who stand firm in the solid rock of values and who can tell when the nation is taking the wrong turn. From where I stand and at my age, I know the country is taking a wrong turn when a 14-year-old child has to go to court to seek justice over KCP marks, Kenya is failing her children. I know the country is taking a wrong turn when workers take home only a third of their basic salaries, the rest going to taxes. When somebody told me that take my salary and give me the tax, I'm better off with the tax than the salary. <laughs> it is wrong when a person earning 50,000 shillings has to surrender 20.5% of that money to compulsory taxes. We need a change that will make our fathers proud of the nation they founded. We need to return to the original vision was selfless leadership that would be a light unto other nations. We need to secure this country and its future by building a mighty democracy that can endure and withstand the worst of the challenges to our nationhood that might emerge in future. And I believe it is possible. It can be done. We can do it. God bless Kenya. Hello. Uh, I thought it would be proper for me to just say a few words only. First, I appreciate the issues that have been raised by those who have had an opportunity to speak on behalf of the others. All of them actually point out one thing, that things are not going in the right direction in our country. That Kenya needs uh, some kind of rectification. Project Kenya. Somebody asked about the compensation for the Mau Maus. That is a subject for another day. But I want to say that, you know, throughout the history of our country, there have always been two forces pulling in two opposite directions. 
that the protests for change and development, the forces for retention of the status quo, and those who have been fighting to retain the status quo. Even when people were fighting for independence, that those whose intention was basically to remove the colonial system, remove Azungus, and bring in an, uh, an, uh, an African regime, and they used those powers which the colonialists were using to oppress the natives, use it themselves as Africans to lord it over fellow Africans. That's why the when the Mzungu went, they said Wazungu Weusi or Mengia. They came in, they transplanted the colonial system, and then themselves became the colonizers. They're using the very same system that the, the, the British were using to oppress the African people, they're using it to oppress the African, the fellow African people. There are those who say they wanted to make independence meaningful. People were fighting against colonialism because the colonial system was ruthless, was alien, was dictatorial. They wanted to replace it with a system that was more responsive to their needs, a system that will be more humane, a system that will enable them to realize their dreams. And that's why they are talking about the fundamental rights of the people of Kenya, the right to life, the right to food, the right to shelter, the right to health, the right to education, so the fundamental human rights of our people. And if you can guarantee those rights, Kenya can prosper. So we have seen this before the first regime came and went. The second regime came and went. And the, the first regime, there was attempt to allow a people to get into the economy of this country. So a, a kind of a, an African middle class was emerging, but it was still very small. The major part of middle class was still very much alien. The second class that came, the second regime, tried to suppress that emerging Africa, African middle class and create what is called the Comprado bourgeois, Comprado regime, commission agents. Those whose dreams were just to let a commission happen, commission happen, commission happen. It impoverished our people completely. The third regime tried, tried, and there's a clear vision. That's why that regime came up with the vision, vision 2030, which was aimed at removing our people from poverty to a middle income status by the year 2030. And this is a clear a vision for the first time. I am happy to be having the part and parcel of coining that vision 2030. <laughs> but after that again, we, we, we lost direction now. The thing became a little bit um, gray, grayish. Now we've come back to the dark era, trial and error. Everything goes. You can come here and, and lie sell the lie here, he to safanya he, to safanya he, to rajenga he, to safanya he, to safanya he, everything to safanya to safanya. Kesho, he, can safanya hands up, safanya up, 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 all the times, just promises and promises. They say this gentleman lies all the times, and all the times, and that is, see gentlemen here, even if you give them 100 years, they will still just be lying. Nothing will happen under this stupid regime. I thank you very much. <laughs>